like the velocity of an object. And so what I want to do is a couple problems with you guys. We're actually going to use the book. We're going to use the book here in a moment to also do a problem. If you have a book handy, you might want to take it out. Okay. And um, let's kind of pick up where we left off yesterday with, uh, again, with talking about these velocity applications. The problem I'm going to do with you here, it's not in the book. It's kind of like the most fundamental application problem. It's basically the bare bones, making sure that you understand the main idea. It's similar to yesterday. I just want to go over another one with you. So we have a position equation. It represents like vertical motion. You don't really need to know all that, but it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt to know that we have an object that must be being thrown upwards. We're back to meters per second. Okay. In physics class, you guys had to write these equations. I'm not going to make you write them. We're basically going to give you the equation. So that's nice. But Let's use it. Let's use it to do a pretty fundamental idea here. Okay, we're going to find the instantaneous velocity when the time is 2. Okay, now I want to make sure that you're getting the main idea. I uh, also want you to make sure that you don't make this too hard. When you see the word instantaneous velocity, that's kind of code for the derivative because the derivative is going to be a tangent and a tangent is like a straight line that gives you the slope at that instant point. So instantaneous velocity is really just a fancy word for the derivative. And it's a pretty nice tool. You can do the derivative of position. It'll get you the velocity equation, the instantaneous velocity equation. Now make sure when the derivatives are a little easy like they are right here that you still get them right. The derivative of 16t is 16. The derivative of 0.8t squared, well, you're going to bring the exponent down. So you're going to double 0 0.8, you get 1.6. Make sure you subtract from the exponent. Of course, you get just t to the first. Okay, so that's your velocity equation. That's your velocity formula. And just like you always do when you have a formula, you plug into it. Again, pretty straightforward problem. I'll plug in 2. I am showing the work because I'm trying to model it for you. If you do a problem like this in your assignment, you should show, I shouldn't say should, you have to show the derivative. And then at that point, you could do whatever you need to do, maybe with a calculator um, and produce your answer. Make sure you understand that the answer here is a rate. So I'd like you to label it that way. It's meters per second as shown in this problem. We're in meters and seconds. So throw the rock up in the air after two seconds, or maybe we should say at two seconds, that sucker's traveling at 12.8 meters per second. Okay, now I hope you understand that in the next second or in the next moment of time, it's going to be a different slope. It's going to be a different rate. Okay, obviously the rate is changing as the object goes up and comes back down, but that's just the instant of two. Here's another pretty fundamental question. We'll just stick with this one. The idea of a maximum height. The idea of a maximum height. Now, what we're trying to get you to think about is something that's true at a maximum height. 
something involving the velocity at a maximum height. Again, maybe some fundamental ideas from physics, but if I throw something up in the air, at the moment it gets to the top, something is happening. At the moment it gets to the top, the velocity is equal to zero. So we have that moment in time when the object stops. Kind of interesting. But we can take full advantage of that. We can set the velocity equation equal to zero. We can set the velocity equation equal to zero by saying that 16 minus 1.6t, again, will equal zero. And again, this is taking advantage of that simple idea that at a maximum, that will always be true. Okay, you got yourself a little equation to solve. Basically, divide by 1.6. Divide by 1.6, and you end up with 10. Now make sure you realize, even though we don't really need to do this, I still want you to realize that what's happening here is we have a position graph, which happens to be an upside down parabola. It's upside down because it's got a negative x squared. Okay, so we have an upside down parabola, negative x squared. And we basically just determined that at 10 seconds, that we end up with the horizontal tangent. We end up with a velocity of zero. I guess what I'm kind of saying is, you know, that's what we expect. Now, I don't know if we expected 10, and that's what we had to find, but at the top, you know that your tangent line is going to be zero. And then just kind of one more question. Again, I'm trying to go through pretty much sort of the most fundamental type problem. Here's something to chew on. And as you chew on it, make sure that you make sure that you don't use velocity. Okay, the problem has nothing to do with velocity. Okay, it's not a special velocity. In fact, the word velocity doesn't really show up at all. So when we use 60, excuse me, when, when we, yeah, when we use 60, we're going to make sure that we go back to the equation that matches. And so I'm trying to get you to go back to the original equation where you can, in the same manner, you can set it equal. But again, notice that we're setting equal to the original equation to the position equation. All right, and you certainly might see some questions that kind of deviate from derivatives. Again, derivatives represent the velocity, but this problem doesn't use it. Now, as you look at this equation, sort of math should kick in, uh, meaning like some math from other years. You know, you got to realize, oh, geez, okay, I'm solving this for t. Yes, you're solving it for t. Um, hmm. When you have an equation of this form, when you have an equation of this form, it's often helpful for the equation to equal zero. So if you weren't thinking that way, let me kind of nudge you and say, yeah, if you make this equation equal to zero, um, you're going to be doing yourself quite a favor. And that favor is that you've basically created, you've created a quadratic equation. Okay, it's a quadratic equation. It's got the look. It's kind of got that ax squared plus bx plus c look. And as the teacher says, ax squared plus bx plus c, does anything else kind of come to mind as far as how you're going to solve this for t? Remember, it's a quadratic equation. Okay. Your response is kind of normal. That's why we're going over this again. 
You got to use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula. Now, the quadratic formula, remember, that's one of those things you want to be able to teach to your kids. And so, if you don't want to teach the quadratic formula to your kids, then don't have kids. Otherwise, when they're at the kitchen table and they're like, how do you do the quadratic formula? You have to remember it. It's the opposite of B. Remember, it's the opposite of B plus or minus the square root. This is practice for when you teach this to your kids. It's the opposite of B plus or minus square root of. If that's part of it, but there's something that comes before 4AC. B squared. B squared minus 4AC. Oops, I'm going to fill in the numbers here. All over 2A. All over 2A. All right, somebody's ready to teach it to their kids. It's unforgettable, isn't it? Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm making sure that you guys realize that the quadratic formula is going to pop up. It actually pops up in this assignment, and honestly, it's going to pop up other times this year. Don't forget about it. Make sure you can do it. Yes, I'm going to give you the answer, but... Again, make sure you can do it. Sometimes students still have trouble squaring negative 16, you know, typing this in the right way. If you want to break it down a little bit, you're going to end up with, it turns out, the square root is 64, which is kind of nice. The problem's kind of a textbook problem because the numbers work out nicely. So 16 plus or minus 8 and... Remember that you get two answers out of that. You get two answers. Which shouldn't surprise you too much, seeing that most of you said you took some physics, even if you didn't take physics. We have a basic idea going on here. There are two times, 15 seconds and 5 seconds. It wouldn't be a bad idea to label them. But we've got 15 seconds and 5 seconds when we're at 60 feet. Okay, now 60 feet could be represented by that simple sketch. And again, we shouldn't be super surprised that we have two spots where that's happening. 5 and 15. Because obviously it goes up and then comes back down. Good standard problem. Okay. Now, I want you to have a chance to kind of look at sort of just one more good standard problem. It has, it, it deviates from this a little bit. Okay. But it's still, it's kind of like the types of problems you're going to see in your assignment. So on page 129, page 129. Number two. Now, I don't assign you this exact problem, but I do assign you a couple problems that are right beside it. So this makes for a good example for the classroom. But this time, I want you to be a little bit more involved in it. Like, see if you can get letter A. Number Now I intend to be a step behind you, so if you're like, oh boy, I don't know if I can do letter A, okay, well, we'll go over it, but I still want you to think about it first.
letter A is probably a little bit more of a physics problem than it is like a calculus problem. Honestly, we have to understand what displacement means. I'm going over this so that we can continue to remember that it's like the change in position. The change in position can be thought of as the uh, final position minus the initial position, sometimes shown as S of B minus S of A. You could write that down if you want. You can actually just do S of B minus S of A. That would be for this problem. That would be my final time of uh, what? Five seconds. And then my initial time. So again, displacement is like a change in position. It helps to have taken physics, which a lot of you did. But if you didn't take it, you can still do this. Make sure you understand that this has nothing to do with the derivative. Okay, it's just straight up plug in five into the original equation and plug in zero. Should end up with numbers like 12 minus two. So we plug five in, we plug zero in. Now it's helpful to realize that 12 is like the position, uh, meaning like I guess since the particle is moving left and right, I'm like I'm 12 units to the right. And in the initial position, I started at two. But of course, if I go from 12, 2 to 12, I end up with a displacement of 10. Okay. Again, this particle is kind of like moving back and forth. It's moving like left and right. Try to keep going. Maybe you're ready to look at letter B. Now, as a little hint, letter B is not the derivative, not yet. It says average velocity. Average velocity. I don't understand yet. When you plug zero into the uh, original equation, you actually don't get zero because if you plug zero in, you still have two. So it's kind of like saying I'm starting at two at a time of zero. So it's going to be 12 minus two versus maybe 12 minus zero, 12 minus two. Now listen, folks, velocity, velocity, it's like a rate, okay? We had an instant rate. An instant rate is the derivative. That's easy, okay? But an average rate, an average rate is actually like the good old regular slope. It's like the change in your position over the change in time. In other words, like the rise over the run. Again, like the regular slope. So it's, it's not a derivative. Okay, you have to realize that the change in y, like the rise, that's your displacement. You changed by 10. And that happened in 5 seconds. So if you change by 10, and that happens in 5 seconds, you averaged 2 does this thing have a, a unit on it? Meters, so it would be like two meters per second. Now, letter A and letter B, I know they were maybe kind of new. Maybe you weren't sure. But still, I'm, I want you to try to think about them. Because it leads us to letter C, where we hopefully get to a more comfortable place, that instant velocity. See if you can do letter C. We're looking for the instant. A 
as soon as you see the word instant, that's the derivative. Okay, so you actually want to find the derivative equation. And then, of course, take full advantage of it by plugging in. Okay, 8 minus 3, of course, is 5 meters per second. If you're thinking about the numbers a little bit, you might be noticing that the average is different than the instant. Okay, all that means is that the particle must have a different speed at different times. It's not like it's the same speed the whole time. On average, it's two meters per second, but apparently at four seconds, it's a little faster. Okay, maybe you did a lab in your physics class where you had like the motion detector that was going tick, 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 and you were trying to walk closer to that motion detector, right? Did you? All right, good. So we still do some things that I remember doing. But basically, the velocity is different uh, for each time. Try to keep going. Letter D's got a little surprise there. Acceleration. Now, we didn't do acceleration yesterday, but we talked about it. Well, I guess actually we did do it. It's, it's the next derivative. Okay. It doesn't always have to be a constant. It turns out that it is a constant, so it's always 2 meters per second squared. Again, that's just the derivative of our previous formula. So the derivative of 2t minus 3 is just 2. Let's see if we can squeeze in this letter E here before we break. What is true when... Uh, something in motion changes direction. What's true when I change direction about my velocity? Right. So whether I throw something up in the air and it comes back down and changes direction or whether I'm walking left and right, when I change direction, my velocity is equal to zero. Okay. That's a key idea. Make sure that you process that. It's actually really easy to, in, in the application, it's really easy. All you do is set your derivative. I should say your velocity. You set your velocity equal to zero. Okay, so add three, divide by two, and you get three halves, one and a half seconds. So basically for, it appears that for, um, the first one and a half seconds, I'm going in a certain direction. And then for the other uh, seconds, you know, the direction changes. Okay. Kind of like your motion detector lap. We're not going to do letter F. We're not going to do F. All right. That's a good spot to break. <laughs>